My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Today, I'm back looking at Sima Qian, the most famous historian, the first historian in Chinese history. We are going to look today at a passage that is in some ways representative of Sima Qian's work, but in other ways is quite special. Okay, it's representative because it is a chapter that he has on the Chinese encounter with the Yue a group that Sima Qian would have considered a barbarian group. It is special because those people, the Yue, the country that they had was called the Nan Yue, or the Southern Yue. The Yue were a group of people who occupied what is today modern Guangdong and Guangxi provinces in China and northern Vietnam, roughly the Red River Valley, that urban area including Hanoi, Vietnam's capital. In fact, the name of Vietnam derives from Nan Yue. Originally, they wanted to call themselves Nan Yue, or in the local Vietnamese language, Nan Viet. But the Chinese emperor would not allow it. So he flipped the two characters. Instead of Nan Yue, he had them called Yue Nan, or as it's called in Vietnamese, Vietnam. <laughs> Can you tell I took a semester of Vietnamese? Really want to learn Vietnamese, but just haven't had time. Okay, back to Sima Qian. In a way, Sima Qian's chapter on the Nan Yue is the origin story both of the Yue of Guangdong, today China's largest province, with a whopping 127 million people. That's about the same as the population of Mexico. If Guangdong today were an independent country, it would be the world's 11th largest. That's not even to mention Guangxi, and their next-door neighbor, the much smaller province, and the people of Vietnam, who there's about 100 million people in that country. So this is a really important chapter in the history of the world. Sima Qian is the one to document this origin story. In China, the Yue roughly correspond to where Cantonese today is spoken in China. That's in addition to the northern portion of Vietnam. Today, the Cantonese people actually still claim this Yue identity, even though the government classifies them as Han Chinese. If you were to go to Guangzhou, also known as Canton, which in Sima Qian's day was known as Panyu, you will find driving around Guangzhou, that the license plates of the province begin with the character Yue. This is the exact same Yue as we're talking about with the Nan Yue. They call the language that they speak Cantonese, that is Yue Yu, and they call the food that they eat Yue Cai. So the Yue identity is very much operative in Cantonese regions in China today. Now, Let's jump in to the story as related by Sima Qian. We go back to a time around the time that Hannibal was crossing the Alps. This is the point where the Yue were first colonized by the Chinese. Qin Shi Huang, the first person to unite the empire today that we know as China. Qin Shi Huang sends troops into the Yue territory in 220 BC. And based on what Sima Qian says, he used the territory in a way that many subsequent Chinese emperors would use it. That is, for settler colonialism and as a dumping ground for banished officials. As Sima Qian says, The Qin used banishment to send regular Chinese folks there, and for 13 years they lived amongst the Yue. One of these officials who was sent down there to the Yue to either control them or banish them. We really don't have that much information from Sima Qian on him initially. This guy was named Zhao Tuo. Zhao Tuo was an ethnic Chinese bureaucrat from northern China. He happened to be in the right spot at the right time. Qin Shi Huang dies, and his children turned out to be easily manipulated. The Qin dynasty it's called a dynasty. It's not really a dynasty because it collapses pretty much after Qin Shi Huang dies. China descends into a civil war. Zhao Tou responds. He cuts the Yue lands off from the rest of China. That's easy to do because of the mountainous territory separating Nan Yue from China. Any official who was still loyal to China, Zhao Tou has that official assassinated. Zhao Tou establishes the Nan Yue as an independent state called Nan Yue. He proclaims himself the founder of this country known as Nan Yue, or the Southern Yue, 
After the civil war in China ends, Liu Bang defeats Xiang Yu and establishes the Han Dynasty. Liu Bang is now the first emperor of the Han Dynasty. He wants the Yue back, but he has a problem. In the midst of the civil war, Zhao Tuo does a pretty good job of establishing and solidifying his rule down there in the south. He has armies that are loyal to him, and it's actually hard to invade the Nanyue because southern China is so mountainous. It's very easily defendable territory. Liu Bang is also still settling things down in the main parts of China. Liu Bang's got to be thinking, do I really want to go risk a shellacking if I go in to Nanyue and try to do battle with them, even though I am bigger than them. Still, it's a really hard thing to invade a country, as Vladimir Putin can now tell you. Liu Bang and Zhao To make a compromise. Zhao To gets to keep everything he has just exactly as it is. The only thing he has to do is to swear loyalty to Liu Bang and the Han Dynasty. In other words, on paper, Zhao To is going to be loyal to the Han Dynasty. In fact, Zhao To can keep his independent nation in everything other than name. That situation lasts until 195 BC. In that year, Liu Bang dies. His wife, Empress Lu, takes over China. At some point during her rule, she says, you know what, I'm tired of this Zhao To, this bum down in the south, being allowed to be independent. What does she do? Empress Lu hits Nanyue with economic sanctions. Wow, this is really relevant to today's geopolitics. Hmm. Empress Lu hits Nanyue with these economic sanctions, and then just to be a jerk, she may, it's not clear based off the sources that I have, but she may have also had Zhao Tuo's brothers and sisters who are still living up in, in the main part of China. She may have had them killed. And she may also have had Zhao Tuo's parents' graves still up in northern China dug up. Zhao Tuo is incredibly angry. And this is what Sima Qian reports Zhao Tuo as saying. Quote, when Emperor Liu Bang recognized me as king, he allowed us to trade and exchange ambassadors. Now Empress Lu is listening to the slander of a minister. She treats us differently as if we were barbarians and cuts us off from trade. End quote. In other words, it is on. Zhao Tuo invades China. He invades the Han territory. Empress Lu is now equally angry. She sends troops after Zhao Tuo. But Sama Qian tells us that it didn't work out for her. Quote, Empress Lu sent General Zhuo Cao, General Zhuo Cao to go and attack Zhao Tuo. It was hot and humid, and lots of his soldiers got sick, and his troops were not able to cross over into Lingnan. Lingnan is another place name for the region that includes Guangdong, Guangxi, and northern Vietnam. It literally just means south of the Ling mountain, Mountains. That is the mountain range that separates the Cantonese-speaking areas from the rest of China. After this, there are seven or eight decades where Nanyue and Han Dynasty China exist kind of in peace. They kind of get along, but eventually China will take over the Yue lands, but not without a lot of trouble. Let's fast forward to the period where Sima Qian describes the destruction of Nanyue as an independent kingdom. There was a war between Nanyue and the Han Dynasty from 1113 BC to 111 BC. This was a period in which Sima Qian was actually alive. Sima Qian was probably an eyewitness to some of the events that he describes. He's serving in the court of Han Wudi, probably the most important emperor in the Han Dynasty. So we have two combatants. In corner one, we have Han Wudi, the emperor of the Han dynasty. He wanted to expand his country. He smote the barbarians in the north, the Xiongnu, and he is also just getting ready to invade the Nanyue. On the other side, in Nanyue, we have Zhao Yingqi, the great-grandson of Zhao Tuo. Uh, Zhao Yingqi had successfully balanced relations with China, but in 113 BC, Zhao Yingqi dies. He left the Nanyue in the small, small hands of Zhao Xing, his six-year-old son. And like so many first graders who find themselves king, King Xing was young, dumb, and mostly listened to his mom. 
But there were two problems with his mom. So his mom is named Queen Dowager Zhou. Queen Dowager Zhou had been born in China before becoming Zhao Yingqi's concubine and giving birth to the future King Xing. Thus, she already has a question of loyalty. Is she going to be loyal to the Nanyue, which she's kind of the queen of? Or is she going to be loyal to the China, the Han dynasty of her birth? The second problem, she was compromised. Queen Dowager Zhou had had sex with a Chinese guy before getting married to Zhao Yingqi. A big no-no if you're thinking about things from a Confucian misogynistic perspective. Women were expected to be entirely faithful to the men who they were married to. There's no expectation for men to be faithful to their wives. But the, the queen especially has to be faithful to her husband. Otherwise, there's a real chance that things will get weird, not only in terms of sexual relationships, but also politics, because you never know if the son who becomes king is the legitimate heir to the father. So the queen dowager Zhou had had sex with a Chinese guy before getting married to Zhao Yingqi. The name of that man who she had the sexual relationship with is Anguo Xiaoji. All of this made the people of Nanyue suspicious of queen dowager Jules, possibly having split loyalties, just as she had had split legs. And that metaphor is not mine. That comes from Chinese. In Chinese, to pi tui, it means literally to spread one's legs. So you can use it to talk about doing splits in gymnastics. But it is also a euphemism for two timing, as if one person's legs are spread between two different boats. Making the situation even worse, Han Wu Di, in a piece of Machiavellian diplomacy, who does he send to be his ambassador to Nanyue in an attempt to undermine Nanyue's sovereignty? You guessed it, it's Anguo Xiaoji, Queen Dowager Zhou's lover. Here is what Sima Qian has to say about that. Quote, the king was young, the queen dowager was Chinese, and she had previously had relations with Anguo Xiaoji. While Anguo was in Nanyue as the ambassador, they fornicated. The people of Nanyue mostly knew what was going on, and they did not really like the queen dowager. Hamudi's dirty trick worked. Having horizontally collaborated with the enemy of Nanyue, the queen dowager was happy to collaborate in the more traditional fashion. She encouraged her son to sell out the Nanyue, extinguishing the country's independence and becoming a part of the Han Empire. Again, from Sima Chen, I quote, The Empress Dowager feared the Nanyue people revolting against her, and she also wanted to rely on Han Chinese power. Several times, she urged the king and ministers to become incorporated into Han China. But there was a local Nanyue official who, like most of the Nanyue elites, did not want to get in bed with the Han dynasty. His name is Lu Jia. He plotted to seize power from King Xing and his China-loving mom. Han Wudi knew that the Empress Dowager was in a tight spot, so he called on his military officials. According to Sima Qian, Han Wudi asked these officials to take 2,000 troops and teach the Yue a lesson. The first general he asked, his name is Zhuang San, and he demurs. He says 2,000 troops, that's not enough to wage what's essentially a counterinsurgency in a colonial invasion. So Han Wudi asks a different general. This second general's name is Han Qianzhou. Han Qianzhou brushes off Zhuang San's concern, saying he would be able to whoop those southern barbarians with only 200 troops. Quoting again from Sima Qian, This little trifling Yue is nothing. Furthermore, we have the king and the queen dowager on our side. It is only minister... Liu Jia, who is causing the problems. I could take just 200 brave warriors and will definitely pay Minister Liu Jia back by cutting off his head. It didn't quite work out for Han Qianzhou. Uh, as Han Qianzhou invades, Liu Jia begins his revolt. Liu Jia murders King Xing, King Xing's mom, and the Chinese ambassador, Anguo Shaoji. Liu Jia also allows Han Qianzhou to invade the Nanyue, at first without much resistance. This was a trap. Liu Jia was encouraging Han Qianzhou to overextend his lines, which is exactly what Han Qianzhou did. As Han Qianzhou approached what is today called 
Guangzhou, but was then called Panyu. Lu Jia's armies fell on him, destroying Han Qianchou's troops. Han Wudu was angry. He responded by sending two massive invasion forces down into Nanyue. One force consisted of 100,000 marines on towering ships, according to Sima Qian. These two forces in the second invasion destroyed Lu Jia's government and put an end to the independence of the Nanyue kingdom. And that's the story of how Nanyue was briefly independent for a bit more than a century. Today, this story is important to Cantonese nationalists. They occasionally point to this story as the origins of the Cantonese as a separate nation, a nation separate from the Chinese nation. I'm not saying, I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying Cantonese nationalists will make that claim. Um, Of course, the Vietnamese also point to this story as the origins of the Vietnamese as an independent nation. The Vietnamese sometimes point to Zhao Tuo as the founder of the first Vietnamese dynasty, and they definitely point to Lu Jia as a hero of Vietnamese independence. There's actually a cave in the Thai Temple in Hanoi that is a shrine made out for Lu Jia. So the story is still relevant to my friends listening in Vietnam and in Guangdong. And those folks who live in the U.S. or France or wherever who still have a connection with the Cantonese or Vietnamese-speaking worlds. I'm going to end with a Chung Yu. I wanted a Chung Yu that used the term P but I couldn't find anything that used those exact words. So I found something that's kind of close. The Chung Yu is Hong Xing Chu Chang. Literally, the red apricot comes out of the wall. Originally, this was just a cheng yu that was used to describe the beauty of spring, spring being this period of vivacious life emerging from the wall. So that the, this red apricot, it burst out of the wall. But eventually, this cheng yu comes to be about cheating. The red apricot representing female sexuality, which if you look at a red apricot and cut it in half, It's not that much of a leap. The red apricot coming out of the wall signifies a woman coming out of the boundaries that are supposed to bind her in this Confucian society. She emerges through the walls and she goes off cheating. Hong Xing Chu Chang. The red apricot comes out of the wall. A Cheng Yu for a woman cheating. That's it for me. If you have any thoughts on the podcast, please send me an email, chineseliteraturepodcast at gmail.com. I'm slow to respond, but I do respond to emails eventually. If you want to show your love for the podcast in a monetary fashion, find the podcast on Patreon, Chinese Literature Podcast at patreon.com. I am Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.